Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. The text for the second Sunday in Lent comes from our Gospel reading. Jesus answered him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. In the name of Jesus. Amen. So, if you want to enter the kingdom of God, you must be born again, or born from above. The Greek is rather ambiguous about which one it is. Greek is weird in that sort of way. The same word can mean any different number of prepositions or adverbs. One has to take into context what is being said in order to properly translate it. But it probably doesn't matter all that much. Or maybe it actually does. I'm not that smart of a man. Many smarter men than me have spent centuries debating whether it should be again or from above. I suppose it all depends on whether or not you are understanding Jesus correctly. And perhaps that's exactly Nicodemus' problem. He wasn't sure where Jesus was going with this whole conversation. And maybe we don't either, because Jesus is leading us in a conversation of the gospel. And like you've heard a million times from this pulpit before, the gospel is a, a bit of a mystery And so we pick up the story in the evening, not during the daytime when there would be a whole crowd of people all around Jesus, and not when the other Pharisees could hear Nicodemus and his attempt to have an actual real conversation with Jesus about real things and real truths. For our text for today comes on the heels of chapter 2, where Jesus goes into that temple and he causes a whole bunch of trouble out with the money changers and out with the sacrifices. The end has come to treating God's house like a den of thieves. And this, if you haven't already guessed, has caused some problems with the religious authorities. The two chapters, chapter 2 and 3, are related, of course, because the temple had always been about the gospel as well. Even with all of its rules and regulations, with all of its do's and with its don'ts, The stuff that happened at the temple was about the gospel. It was about making people clean. It was about God's work of atonement taking place for the good of the people, for their salvation, for the forgiveness of their sins. The problem was, at some point in time, the temple had been turned into only the things of the law, and the Pharisees and the priests had taken this good gift from God and turned it into something that needed to be done, as if they were earning God's favor through the works of their hands. And Jesus, he had had enough of this, for his time had now come, and so he made a whip of cords, thrashing away everyone who had turned the gift of God, the gift of the gospel, into an ugly, sinful work. And isn't this always the case? The entire Old Testament is littered with examples of sinners trying to repurpose God's good gifts. But this is the way of the sinner. He can't help but take the gospel and turn it into the law because the sinner always wants to be involved with his own salvation. Just think of all of the ways in which sinners within the church have attempted to screw around with God's good gospel gifts. Take, for example, that First divine service in the tabernacle that saw the two sons of Aaron attempt to add their own little work into this service. We always think that doing so will make things better, as if God needs our help to make things perfect. Well, they ended up struck dead right there on the spot. God doesn't like when we try and take his gospel and add to it. Better that we just leave it alone. But of course, I'm getting ahead of myself here. If it, it seems as if Nicodemus really did want to have a, a real conversation with Jesus, hence that cover of night sort of stuff that we've already talked about. But it's at this point that we should probably 
take notice of something else in our text. The conversation didn't go as old Saint Nick thought it would. Instead, Jesus immediately hijacks that conversation and takes it to the place where he wants it to go. And there's probably a good reason for that. If Jesus had let Nicodemus lead the way, they never would have gotten to the place that they needed to be. They never would have ended up at the gospel. And that's because the sinner can never end up at the gospel on his own. The sinner will always drive the conversation to the law, to something that he must do, to something that he must accomplish. The sinner will always revert back to the work of his hands, and so he'll always ask questions like, what must I do to be saved? Or how can I be a better person? Either that or he'll just want to show God how well he's already done, how much he's already sacrificed for him, how good he really is, and how righteous he has already made himself to be. Perhaps when dealing with the things of life, the things of salvation, we should just sit back and let Jesus do all of the talking. And I know it's not going to end up making a whole lot of sense. There's probably not going to be a whole lot of law talk unless that law is about how utterly sinful we are and how completely pathetic our works actually are. And maybe there will also be something about how the law must be fulfilled too, but that it's going to be fulfilled outside of us. And so that, of course, is actually just the gospel. And so, yes, in these conversations, things may be a little bit confusing, but just go with it. By the end, you'll have the gospel presented right before your eyes, and none of your questions about the law will matter anymore. So Jesus, he says that you have to be born again. He means born from above, but again, works too. Because being born is completely a passive thing, isn't it? No one who has been born had anything to do with it. You didn't choose to be born. You didn't ask to be born. You didn't add something to your birth. It was done for you. It was done upon you. You were just a passive little receiver of this thing called life. And that's good. And it's for this reason that there's no better way to actually talk about salvation. Jesus equates your salvation, your new life in him, with your birth, with the beginning of your life. If you want to see the kingdom of God, then you have to realize that seeing it has nothing to do with you. There isn't a single thing that you can add to the equation to help the situation. It's all done for you, done upon you. You didn't ask to be born, and yet here you are. You didn't ask to be saved, and yet here you are. And I know it's all a little too simple, which is probably why it's a little too confusing. And Nicodemus, he doesn't seem like he gets it, and I'm not sure I do 100% either. He's still thinking in that rational sort of way. And so he wants to show Jesus just how absurd Jesus is sounding. How can you climb back into the womb and be born again? Now, Nicodemus isn't an idiot. He's a teacher of Israel. He understands that what he's asking can't be done. No one can climb back into the womb. It's impossible for man to do. And here he's on the right track. He just doesn't know it. Of course it's impossible for man to climb back in the womb. And so of course it's impossible for man to have anything to do with his salvation. And as a teacher of Israel, Nicodemus should know this. In fact, this is the very thing that he should have been teaching Israel all along. He and all the rest of the Pharisees should have realized what they had turned the temple into. They should have made their own whip and done away with all of that evil before Jesus even had the chance, but they didn't. Which is why Jesus had to come and do it for them. And again, this just shows the whole point of the gospel all over again. Salvation can't come from us. We can't be an active participant in it. 
It has to come to us, be done for us, be given to us. All that we can do is receive. And Jesus, he tells us how we are to receive by being born again, by being born from above. But this isn't a fleshy sort of birth. It's a spiritual one. You must be born of water and the Spirit. That's baptismal talk, in case you haven't caught it. Jesus is laying out how exactly this new birth thing is going to look. And I know, again, it's all too simple. How can splashing water on someone have such great effect on them that they're born again, born from above? We want to know the how of it. But the how isn't going to make all that much sense because water doesn't do anything. But it is the Word of God combined with the water that brings this salvation to you. And if you want to interject the law into this, if you want to try and turn this baptismal gift into a work of your own hands, a decision that you have to make, then you're going to be missing the whole point. Baptism is the gift of God that brings you new life. But you might say, how can this be done? Simple water, even if it has some Trinitarian name combined with it, surely couldn't do such amazing, great things. Well, again, this would just be another example of us trying to lead the conversation. If God says baptism saves, then it saves. It saves because he said it does. And he's the author of life. He speaks things into existence. He makes it so. When he says, let it be, there is. He creates with his word, even if we can't understand it. Why would we want to follow Nicodemus' lead and try to explain to God why his promise for us won't do what he promises? Well, Jesus, he can see that Nicodemus is having a bit of a hard time with all of this. Born again, born from above, born of water and the Spirit stuff. So he decides that it's about time to make things a little bit more clear. Remember Moses, he says? Remember that time when the people of Israel were bitten by venomous snakes because of their wickedness and unbelief? Remember when they were dying And there wasn't a thing that they could do to save themselves. Well, God brought them salvation. But he did it in a weird sort of way. He had Moses craft a bronze serpent and place it on a pole. And when the people cast their gaze upon that strange thing, they were saved. Well, Jesus continues, I'm going to let you in on a secret. It wasn't the bronze serpent that saved them. It was me. And I'm about to do the same thing, but on a much greater scale. I'm about to be lifted up on a tree. It's going to be a strange and gruesome sight. But when I do that, I will be taking all of the sins of the world upon myself. They will all be gone from you, taken away from you. The kingdom of God right there in front of your eyes. And you will have done nothing to earn it. It will all be done for you. For when the Son of Man is lifted up upon the cross, He will become that Passover Lamb whose blood is poured out so that the angel of death passes over all those who are covered in it. But this time, the blood won't be smeared on doorposts or lintels. This time it will be smeared upon foreheads. This time it's going to cover blathering little babies and helpless little children even grown adults in a cleansing water of baptism. This time it will cover you. This time I will cover you. Me and my cross, Jesus says, will cover you. John three sixteen through 17 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. And how do you know that all of that applies to you? Right here, right now, today. 
Well, it's a gospely little thing again. It's not going to make a whole lot of sense. But it's true because God declares it to be true. You were born again. You were born from above. You're baptized into Christ. 